we just cut right in on that, didn't we? You know, in my own journey on the deep end, I've tried to lay out a metaphysic and a way of seeing things. We've tried to explore ideas, little eddies and loops of, of this great mystery that we're in and how to manage it and orient ourselves and just be informed in some new ways of what's going on. So today, I have to say, I'm pretty excited because today we're going to talk about the global brain. It's what a journey, man. Let's think about it for a second. We've gone through being. Things came into being and three essential processes happened. Differentiation, complexification, and semi-permeability. For those of you who've been following the deep end, you've probably heard these before. And those three essential processes create enough complexity, enough differentiation, that a new order of expression happens. And that would be life. Well, guess what? Life also follows the three essential processes, semi-permeability, complexification, differentiation. And what happens is life becomes self-aware, consciousness. And this is the story. I mean, what we're trying to lay out in the deep end is a thread, a story of this great mystery. We're not going to give you the answers to the mystery because I don't think any of us know any answers. But what does consciousness do? If consciousness is semi-permeable, complexification and differentiation, it's doing something. Being goes to life. Life goes to consciousness. What is consciousness going to? Seriously. Is consciousness uh, uh, on the edge of a new order of expression? In 1982, a guy named Peter Russell gave uh, uh, birth to a word called global brain. And he published a book by the same name. Now, some of his ideas uh, were first expressed, believe it or not, by Nicholas uh, Tesla. And if we go on and on, we, we start seeing this progression. So I'm going to go to Wikipedia and just uh, do a real quick, and I mean real quick, uh, definition. The global brain is a neuroscience-inspired and futurological vision of the planetary information and communications technology network that interconnects all humans and their technological artifacts. As this network stores ever more information, takes over ever more functions of coordination and communication from traditional organizations, and becomes increasingly intelligent, it, it increasingly plays a role of the brain for the planet Earth. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Now, if you look at things like uh, the, the World Wide Web. And the guy who invented it, I think his name was something like uh, uh, Tim Berns-Lee. He said that what inspired him was the free associated uh, tech, uh, possibilities of the brain, this interconnectedness. And now we have social media, and the Internet is tying people together into this single information processing system and it functions as part of this collective nervous system. This is a pretty crazy thought. And yet, if you look at what's happening and how it's predicted, it's almost like, wow, well, that's inevitable. So is consciousness creating a new order of expression, like being did to life and life does to consciousness? We first see this in Western civilization uh, in the 19th century, a sociologist by the name of Herbert Spencer coined the word society as a social organism. And entomologist, entomology is the study of insects, William Wheeler basically talked about the formation of a super organism. And he used the ant colony as a metaphor. And then one of my favorites, and the person who first set up camp in my heart regarding this, is a guy named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And he basically described the coming of what he called a planetization of the human family. He predicted increased socialization and this place where everything, and it's irreversible, that something is happening. And he called it the emergence of the newosphere or the global 
mind. Over and over, we can see this. I think Asimov in his Foundation trilogy was, was, was basically shooting at this when he talked about the archive and what that meant uh, to create this great uh, encyclopedia. And who is it? Huh. It's us. So we have this thing around the planet that we now know is one thing. It's called the biosphere, okay? And is the biosphere giving rise to a newosphere, to a, a, a higher order of consciousness? I'll be damned if I can say for sure, but it looks that way to me. So I'm coming to you from Spokane, Washington. My name is Red Hawk. We're here at the deep end, and uh, my cohorts are Mary Ann Ruddis coming from the valley. Uh, in Spokane Valley, and Bob Hayes, who's coming all the way from Florida. Speaking of the global brain, uh, we're just some synapses, I guess, uh, sharing uh, information across the synapse, and, uh, you know, we're part of the global brain, contemplating the global brain, just as our journey has been, you know, what did, what did one of the Buddhas say? Uh, the, the seeker is that which is being sought. Uh, and how do we, we get that place? So I'm going to start with you, Bob. Uh, being a Teilhard, Bob and I read The Phenomenon of Man by Chardin, uh, by Teilhard. Uh, when we both worked for Project Hope. We'd read a paragraph and go, what the hell? <laughs> Bob. Okay, global brain. Uh, is there a difference between a global brain and a global mind? Is there a difference between an individual brain and an individual mind? Uh, nobody really knows the answer to either of those questions yet. Uh, as far as the global mind, I think uh, we're, we're moving in that direction. I don't think we've gotten there yet. But I'm not sure that individuals will be able to perceive a global mind any better than a nerve cell can perceive an individual mind. But whatever it is, it's going to be affecting us as individuals. And that's where that, that interface is where I think the changes are going to happen because we're now open to information much quicker and in a much broader sense than ever before. But still we're dealing with that information as an individual. So I'm, I'm perplexed by this whole topic, just as I've been perplexed by human psychology, human sociology for my whole life. And uh, it's going to be fun to talk about. It. Yeah. And I'll just say one, one little thing is the difference is, a, you know, a neuron's not aware because it's not, I mean, it doesn't know about the brain because it's not aware. But that's part of what I'm suggesting consciousness is, is to be aware and know that you're an interconnected piece. So I'm going to throw that out and we'll put it in a little sidebar. Uh, I want to see what Mary Ann has to say first. Go for it, Mary Ann. Well, I said this at the beginning um, before we, we jumped on. Um, I am baffled as well by this. And I, I think I, I probably, um, you know, the idea of this interconnectedness and um, brain and mind. And you're right, Bob. I think it does come down to what is our individual piece in all of this? But then the whole is greater than the sum of its parts comes to my mind. And so how do we, um, in, in, in flow with it, with that, with whatever's emerging versus fighting against it. And I think that's where that individual piece comes in, where we can recognize that we're part of this, our own minds, our own brains. But then you look at, and, and Red Hockey Brook talked about the technology in the beginning. I mean, we can communicate around the world. Like, uh, it, it's, it's baffling and it's mind-blowing if you think about that, you know, I, I think 
go back a hundred years or 200 years and you tell somebody about what life is like today and it what popped into my mind now is the gods are crazy that movie from a long time ago where um in some remote area of coke bottle drops out of the sky and and this yeah the gods person, must be crazy the gods must be crazy yeah and you go on this search for what is this and where did it come from and so i think our you know, we're on this search for what is all of this and where does it come from, but also where's it going? And so um, I'm with you, Bob. I'm baffled by this and I'm probably not even being coherent in what I'm talking about because I am I feel like my, my mind and my brain is all over the place. Um, and how do we bring it all together? Well, and I don't huh. think we do. I think we're in the process of that happening and even this conversation is part of it. Uh, I think that that uh, it's very difficult to think about a higher order of consciousness. Uh, you know, my first thing is, my God, of all this stuff, how are we going to regulate it? How are we going to control it? And then, of course, that pops into my head is artificial intelligence, you know. Uh, and that, is that another piece of it? And I don't know. I, I think if we're not perplexed by it, we're not being honest. Uh, I think we're being dogmatic because... What we're doing is, uh, you know, we're a monkey contemplating becoming self-aware uh, in, in some real sense. And, and it's, that's why it's futuristic. But I think, uh, you know, the hardwiring of the brain of the Internet allows the group, uh, the, uh, the, the global mind to have a place to interact with itself. Just like uh, the human brain allows us to contemplate, we've gone through a whole lot of you know internal dialogue and all that stuff. All of that's happening on the internet. Matter of fact, Congress is meeting right now to create a law to protect our children, uh, which is in the global brain sense is it's a regulatory thing. I, as I we were doing that, I'm thinking about you know the evolution of the taboos. You know, you don't screw your daughter all of that stuff and how all slow that was to come into uh, moral consciousness, if you will, and self-awareness. And now these little pieces are still trying to show up. And, and it just, I think perplexing is a great word. <laughs> Bob? Well, you know, it's there's a number of different ways that we can deal with this emergence of a global brain, a global mind. Uh, and everybody is, is kind of dealing with it a little bit differently. In some cases, uh, like in the case of the social media uh, hearings that are going on, most of what they're talking about is how harmful social media is. And that's because it's, be it's being used as a political football. And it's, it's much easier for uh, these Congress people to buy into this uh, fearing of the uh, of social media, I don't hear a lot of talk about uh, how useful the internet is, how we can uh, learn new things yeah. and so forth. But we they don't, don't need laws. On we don't need laws to to pass laws to to do what the, the to keep the good things happening. But when yeah, we become aware, I think, I think that we're a long way from any kind of laws. You know, right now they're just. They're just kicking things around that they don't understand. Oh, yeah. What I was going to say is that, that there's also another way to look at it, and that is the idea that this interconnectedness is a reinforcement of what we've talked about for just about every show, uh, and that is how we're all interconnected. All life is interconnected, and certainly... The idea that we can experience what's going on on the other side of the, of the world almost instantaneously is showing how humans are interconnected. So what we do with this idea of this emergence of technology and so forth, it's really up to, to us as individuals to, to figure a way to deal with it. And hopefully we can gather together and deal with it from a uh, perspective of awe and of progress and so forth, and not from a perspective of fear. 
Yeah. Because it's so easy to fall into that fear side. And I, I will know, say that it's 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 now mostly about money and power. And, uh, you know, the mining of data and, you know, mega metadata and all that stuff. We're just now learning how to read ourselves as a, uh, a newosphere, if you will, as a social entity and how to manage that. I think if you look at, uh, you know, the geopolitics of our day, which are quite strained, uh, we've lost sight of what brings us together. Uh, and I think, Bob, you know, the Greek, the squeaky wheel does get the grease. Uh, you know, if it bleeds, it reads, uh, those kinds of things. We know that the Internet has played a part in making young women, girls, uh, feel really bad about themselves. And so how do we, you know, it's almost like um, I have these thoughts that are not good and I want to change them. How do I change my thoughts? Well, we're all working on that one. I don't know about you. I've been meditating for over 50 years. It's still working on changing my thoughts. So I think this is the global brain trying to change its thinking. Go ahead, Marianne. Well, you know, I was just going to say... It all comes down to how this is used, how we as individuals use this. And, you know, you mentioned um, the young girls um, being influenced. Before the Internet, young girls were being influenced by magazines and Twiggy and, and all of those kind of images that were out in the pop culture. I think the difference is it's it permeates every single moment of our life now because we're all connected to our, our smartphones. And it's like, if you leave the house without your phone, um, that's, you, you just have to go back and get it. Right. Um, <laughs> it just, you, you just can't, can't, can't do that. But the other thing too is, you know, we were talking about how, you know, there are good things on the internet, but who defines what's good and what's, what's not good. And so I think as, as we, we can, you know, the data mining and the Facebook will pop up with ads on me that it's like, how do you know me so well? Um, I try very hard not to be known online. And yet I'm still known and because it's not just social media. It's my credit cards. It's my, um, it's, it's my phone, wherever I go, we're all being tracked every single place. And so we can get scared and paranoid about it. But my mind goes to a Star Trek world. I was a big Trekkie fan, you know, and where the computer knows everything. It knows your heart rate. It knows if you're upset. It knows, and, and we're getting there. Yeah, it's and, called a Fitbit. <laughs> right, right. And so, but, but again, it's how do we use that, that knowledge? And, well, and now I think we're at the same. Go ahead, that, Mary. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, if we can use it to improve our lives, improve the world, put safeguards in to protect children, put safeguards in to protect our privacy, um, whatever we have left of it. Um, but, yeah. Oh, and we're trying to do that. And that's what I want us to understand. Think about the human brain's creativity from MRI machines to the atomic bomb, how we use it. See, the global brain is going through the same the same moral dilemmas, and it's not even hooked up yet. I mean, there's no corpus callosum hooking up the different parts of the brain at this point. I assure you, the Internet in China is very different than the Internet in America, uh, which is different in India. I mean, the brain is still bifurcated, if you will. It's all over the place. It hasn't joined itself as a single thinking unit yet. Uh, and I think part of the UN and part of, you know, having the, the, the red line to China and uh, to Russia, even though China's not picking it up since the balloon got shut down, uh, that, that this is what's going on. And I'm going to suggest that we are that interconnection. Think of us. We're the three people across America, and we are synapsing information. We are, we are sharing our perplexity in such a way to, uh, I don't think our, our addressing our perplexity is going to get rid of the mystery, but it allow us to be more alive within the mystery and more at, at the place where I believe consciousness is trying to grow. And Marianne, I think you said it. 
you know, we've talked about this in the past in terms of ethics and morality that, you know, it took the universe a long time to give a shit. Uh, and we are the place where the universe actually cares. It cares about the biosphere in which we live. It cares about each other. And we're trying to do that. Uh, you know, we keep dehumanizing and demonizing each other, and then we draw back. And it's the same, I call it a wave function, from humility to pride, over and over. And uh, it's what the newosphere uh, is is trying to get us together. Uh, but I think it's happening. I think planetization, oh. as, as Deshaudan said, go ahead, Bob. Let me go back to the question that Marianne asks. What is good when, when we're dealing with the Internet? How do we know what is good? Well, I think that the answer to that is it's the same way we know what is good when we're dealing face-to-face -face with each other. We don't act in ways that harm each other. If someone is bullying someone on social media... They are not doing good by any definition that has been accepted by society for thousands of years. We go back to it every time. We go back to the golden rule. We go back to those, those uh, basic laws of existence that we've come up with in order that we don't kill each other, in order that we are able to move together and work together. And again, as individuals, we need to be taught to use these technologies in a moral and an ethical way. And that's where, you know, we've got to reform our schools and we've got to reform our businesses and we've got to reform our governments in order to make sure we use these tools morally, ethically. And that is, is got, I don't think that this, global mind or global brain is really going to emerge until we as individuals within society are able to use it morally and ethically. And, and you know, a huge piece of that is a metric. Uh, and as I was thinking of what, you know, how do we talk about good? And the words that kept coming to mind were three, do no harm. Uh, and if everybody has that at the, at the, as one of the first pieces of the golden rule, <laughs> primary directive of being a human, then it seems to me uh, that's a great starting point. Uh, re remember the three essential processes, complexification, differentiation, and semi-permeability. That semi-permeability of consciousness, we've talked about that. You know, How do you keep the toxic stuff out? How do you keep the stuff that's going to hurt you out? And how do you, you know, all of those pieces are, are at play and we're trying to manage those. And I'm suggesting over and over that the, um, my computer keeps cutting off, uh, that the, we are in the middle of an emergence of this, this global mind. And it's not when it emerges, it's like it is emerging. It hasn't gotten its head out of the water yet. I think most of it's still, you know, uh, underwater. But I think it's got breathing air, and I think that something is emerging, and that's what this podcast is really about. Just to say something's emerging, it's really perplexing, it's the next growing edge of the mystery, and if we look at the, the way that, that everything has happened from being life to consciousness, then, then consciousness isn't going to sit and do nothing. It's going to do what everything else has done. And, you know, and I go back to the Bible uh, podcast, you know. The Hebrew scriptures are the story of complexification, differentiation, and semi-permeability. The whole thing is there. They become uh, humbled, and then they become prideful. Then they become humble. You know, it's the story. It's, it's an analog of the human family. And... Uh, I am convinced we are on the edge of a third world conflict. I think it's going to happen uh, through proxies at first, and then it's going to ignite and happen really fast, and then it'll be over. But it will give us a new call to uh, unite. And regrettably, you know, 
I had a cartoon on the side of my record player in the base, basic training. I think I've shared this before. It had an old bulldog chaplain saying, war is the best way I know to get a people back to God. Uh, I don't know about God, but at least people back together to see we have self-interests. And if we destroy each other, it's like a twin fork tree. You can't destroy one fork without destroying the whole thing. So uh, I'm pitching for the global brain. I'm pr pitching for a growing sense of ethical morality to do no harm and for us to be less concerned about security and more concerned about creativity and curiosity, if that makes sense. Absolutely, that makes sense. And I hope that um, it would be... My, my hope is that we can achieve that without the calamity, but I'm afraid that you might be onto something there. You know, when, when we think about um, the individual versus the collective as well, when, when you say do no harm, so as individuals, we may want to do no harm to ourselves and to our small circle, which may in fact harm the greater society. And so how do we, how do we shift into the, uh, the idea of do no harm for everyone? for everything and um that i i hope it doesn't take destruction first um but we don't you know well I, it's, I a wanna... matter, it's a matter of how we expand that circle you, you talk about we do no harm within our little circle right. but how do we get that circle to encompass the globe that's that's the the real question of our time i think and again, the fine nuances of this. For instance, if I'm getting a shirt that is really nice that was made by 12-year-olds getting a dime an hour, I've done right. harm. And we have to understand that thread that connects that, and that's the interconnectedness. That's the hard wiring of the, of the global brain. And speaking of the hard wiring, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, so I'll go with you first, Marianne. Um, I'm thankful we're connected and we have this way of being connected. It, it's still trippy to me. If someone had said this to me back in the 70s, I would have said, yeah, and we're going to have flying cars too, which we still don't, by the way. Um, so, Marianne, final comments? Well, you know, I think that the, this, you know, you go back to the idea that um, the, this connection and, and how do we operate in a world what it can, it can be very easy to feel powerless when you like you said you go to buy a shirt and you don't know all of those threads that that created that shirt and so you are unwittingly many of us unwittingly contributing to these systems that are destructive and so how do we there was just this horrible horrible train accident in right near my hometown where i grew up and Part of the lamentation that I'm seeing is people saying, I feel so helpless. I don't know what to do. I, I want to be able to fix this. And yet it was only a couple of months ago in, at the end of last year that the union was fighting with Congress for better safety for the, the railroads. And, and we missed that opportunity to rise up and step in at that point. So I think that part of this, we have to take an individual responsibility, become aware of what's going on, become aware of where those threads have come from, and then do whatever is within our own sphere of power so that we don't feel powerless because to me that is, that will be the death of us if we continue to believe that we can't do anything mm -hmm. to stave off disaster and i'm going to suggest yeah. that the feeling of powerlessness is a lack of creativity and that it's that that that's the point where we need to become curious and start ferreting things out and the global brain today even in its emergent form, has already allowed us to, to explore those threads, to follow where uh, something is made and how it's made and what are the conditions of that factory and all of that stuff. That is uh, a, a great aspect of this growing emergent uh, happening. 
Bob, final comments? Yeah, I think that's an important point. Uh, again, it gets back to how do we use this technology? And the fact of the matter is, once we know something is harmful, and then we are faced with that moral dilemma, our individual actions, we have to decide, am I going to support this? Am I going to buy that shirt? Or am I going to look for an alternative shirt and be willing to pay a little bit more money for it? Or go to Goodwill. Those, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's a great decision. That's helping a lot of people. So, again, it, it, it's this interconnectivity, this technology can be very, very useful. But we have to be willing to make the, the moral choices about how we use it and how we govern our actions based upon it. Amen. And I mean, this gets back to uh, something that, that we've talked about, you know, uh, addressing uh, between shows. And, you know, I think about, as Bob was talking, I was thinking about, you know, what really what he's talking about is, um, you know, money. You know, once we knew that petrochemicals were bad, uh, what did we do? Think about it. It all came down to, you know, the, the thing about it is GM had an electric car in, in 1975. And the oil industry literally made them collect all of those up and take them all apart and destroy the parts. You see, that's called a regret. And I think that's what we're going to go to next. What is a regret? Because in this global brain, there's a lot of back swimming we need to do. I mean, there's, there's things we, we, we're trying stuff. And if we get it wrong, we need to go, ah, that's not good. But we don't do that. We let it go downstream a whole bunch and do a lot more harm because people's lives are part of that. You know, think of coal mining. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's part of the whole gig of, of changing and transforming into new human beings. We now know that we are one planet and we now see that the, the planet is, the human beings are trying to harm what, or we're trying to harm what are this five so that we can think together, be together, live together. We can bliss out together. How do we do that? Well, we got to own our regrets. So next week, we're going to talk about regrets. Yeah, all of us got them. And if people say I don't have any regrets, bah, humbug. My friends, blessings. May the oneness be all over you. Till our next time together.